you're not going to be able to be a competent businessman or you're not going to be able to understand journalism or you're not going to be able to be a politician unless you had a larger perspective on what it is that people have done. For example, a knowledge of how politicians had tackled the slum of the 1930s would not have gone amiss as part of the debate about whether we should have a Keynesian or anti-Keynesian view of the recovery. Just one very crude example. Your understanding is incomplete and therefore incompetent without the longer period of examination. There was a huge emphasis in the digital age on the instantaneous. And it's a sort of indiscriminate notion that whatever actually has just recently happened is necessarily of most interest. The whole nature of a tweeting world really means there is a huge privileging of the instantaneous and history is the opposite. But, you know, empirically have we found that one necessarily precludes the other? Absolutely not, or else history in both printed and television form would not be as popular as it is. We were educating a generation that held its nose at the vulgarity of what was actually called presentism. Are we in danger of losing a sense in which history is really necessarily part of our cultural bloodstream, whether you live in Japan or Mexico or anywhere in between? It's possible, it's possible. It can be shoved aside in a tough world as something tediously ornamental, and that's why, you know, historians have to fight and push back against it. A dim light bulb went off in my brain thinking on sense of insecurity about certain areas of history. But if you take institutions in Britain, like the British Museum, the British Museum exists alongside Tate Modern. There are these two instincts in contemporary culture that are both extremely well served. One, the kind of craving to connect ancestry with our contemporary circumstances. The other, representing the sort of febrile quality of reinvention. The two really should live alongside each other and can. It interrupts, you know, the narrative flow even for a bit in order to actually do this. And we thought, we, we, have, we can't not do this. Storytelling is regarded with disdain as kind of juvenile craft. How many graduate departments actually bother to really worry about their students' writing? The writing they bother about is the kind of writing that might or might not get them tenure. This sort of wild hair-splitting scholasticism is the kind of writing which moves you through the academic hierarchy, which is fine, providing you also have a sense that it's a, an important thing to get a grip on the kind of cogent, vivid writing that's needed for popular history. Henry and Thomas rode out to each other, and the king took off his hat in salutation. The two of them then embraced and sat for hours talking the Archbishop's posterior mortified by the chafing of his secret goat hair underwear. Since we made History of Britain, far greater number of academics have not been intimidated by vulgar accusations of dumbing down, which are usually an accusation made by the dumb, who are inattentive to the complexity of the work being produced in popular history, whether on the page or for television. So an increasing number of academics are trying their hand, and that's wonderful. It means that the academy is reaching out to the general public in the way that IPUP is studying. And that can only be a fantastically good and rich thing. I did always want to think about the shots that we might put together. Um, One reason why school pupils are really not actually taking history to GCSE level or you know dropping out early is that it is not a connected story. You know, kids who want to read Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, they actually thrill to the sense of a great timeline from which one sequence of events is generated by another, is born out of a preceding set of crises. Would it be Parliament or would it be a great general like Oliver Cromwell? So, of course, if they jump disconnectedly from the Tudors to the Third Reich, it's nonsensical. It's the opposite from what sort of history should do. So the first thing is really to try and find a way with all the pressures of exams and assessments, nonetheless, to ring fence the preciousness of a chronologically based history. And in a mood of sad friendliness, the King says to Becky, you know, if only you could do what I tell you to do,
I would love to see something which used the web fruitfully, in which our notion of what a textbook is becomes absolutely revolutionised by a responsible, discriminating use of extraordinary availability of both visual and textual sources on the web. But most of all, I would like to see happy, enthusiastic, excited 16-year-olds in their masses knowing the story of our country and what it's done to the world, good and bad. So I have A television can be a great teacher. If the teacher has both ebullience and authority and charm, he can't be so chummy as to be egregiously blokish on the corner, at least, you know, a buttock-clenching embarrassment when you see it happening like that. And the teacher can be, and should be, a storyteller who, what we used to say in History of Britain was debates by stealth. That's to say, you can find a way in the midst of a story to actually pose critical questions. So in the end, was it Mary Queen of Scots, the mother, who had triumphed from the grave over her rival Elizabeth? You do what all the great historians in print did, from Thucydides to Macaulay and onwards, stop people in their tracks and say, who's to be believed? What really counted? Could it have been different? And Mary Stuart never met. Television can bring these things together. It does presuppose an extremely high degree of craft responsibility. And those of us who worked in the business for a long time knows the difference between boredom and attention or clarity and incoherence. It was a body which, according to some, had not fulfilled the purpose for which God had fashioned it. There was what we used to call a snooker moments. In other words, when the audience says, Christ, I've had enough of this, um, snooker's on, in it. Um, and, and he was sort of watch out for the snooker moment, really. It was a little thing with a big name. Magna Britannia, Great Britain. But it can do it thrillingly, I think. And the more we emptied things out often, the more we actually let our viewers do what Collingwood said. They were now doing the reenactment. They were joining <coughs> up the bits, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. It's wonderful to have all the television programmes that we can, but there's no reason why the consumers of history shouldn't generate their own web-based history projects, a kind of cyber reenactment, if you like. And, you know, IPOP is a kind of perfect sort of arbitrator or enabler, really, of responsible but vividly compelling popular history that can use the web in an incredibly fruitful way.